I think a lot of times, and this is really confessional, I am sorry. A lot of times this platform can be treated, or platforms all over the country, can be treated like a pastor's personal soapbox where they can spout off opinions and imaginations and dreams and preferences. But what good would that really do? What good would that do for your soul? What good are my words compared to God's, which you have right in front of you? Or even as God says here to these very prophets who are leading God's people away, what good or what has in common straw with wheat? Or to put it in the modern vernacular, what can a peanut compare to a dry aged porterhouse steak? <laughs> Nothing. You can't compare the two. I remember, I remember the very first time I ate at Texas Roadhouse. Because it made an impression on me. And you imagine you perhaps know where I'm going with this. I was probably five to seven years old. And I was just absolutely fascinated with this idea that it didn't matter what you did with your peanut shells, you could just throw them on the ground. It was awesome. It was so cool to me. You could just pop them open, eat the peanut, and all sense of decorum, you know, you've been brought up by your parents in all of your life to throw things away and to just be neat and clean and tidy and ordinary and, and orderly and stuff. Except when it came to peanuts at Texas Roadhouse. <laughs> There was this safe space secluded for those who could just throw things on the ground. There's something entertaining about that. But imagine, imagine, imagine if I was going to Texas Roadhouse and all I did was spend my time eating peanuts. Or eat, just use this idea. Imagine if I just spent my time deshelling and de-skinning the peanut and then just making a little pile of peanuts but never actually eating the nut itself. That would be... That would be kind of insane. You would question my sanity. But even still, even further, that serves no benefit. But imagine if all I ever did was go to Texas Roadhouse for the peanuts. And I never sat down to eat a steak. You would still perhaps call me insane and question my sanity. <laughs> that's silly. But that's exactly what God says preachers do when they fail to exalt me. And instead, they go off and they preach their own messages, they preach their own opinions, they preach their own visions, they preach their own dreams. And instead of going to God's word and saying, thus saith the Lord, they say, I have a dream. I have a dream. Listen to my visions and my imagined words. God says that's peanuts. Indeed, I would confess to you this morning, my words are peanuts compared to the porterhouse of God's word. And I should never be satisfied with anything less. If all I ever did was offer you my opinions about some such scandal, some such news headline, that would be about as profitable and beneficial to you as peanuts on the floor. It doesn't nourish you. It doesn't lift up your soul. It doesn't feed you. It doesn't fill you. Instead, it leaves you empty, filled with vain hopes and loosely connected, imagined dreams. The message that we stand on, the message that, yes, I would even say that we can die for if need be, that God sent His only Son into this world to remake it through His own blood. That message, I would say, is the lifeblood of this church. And I would say it ought to be the lifeblood of every sinner saved by grace. Why settle for anything less, my friends? Why settle for peanuts when a porterhouse is sitting for you on the table? My prayer for this church, for however many decades God gives me life, is that these halls will reverberate with the message that the Son of God has come down and borne the penalty of your sin on His own shoulders. And He died for it. And He paid for it by His own blood. That's the message that saves sinners and that changes the world. It's not dreamy. It's not imagined. It's real.
It's as real as the blood of Jesus that spilled and mixed with Jewish mud. That's how real it is. That's how real your Savior is. That's how real your hope is.